And now for our weekly news segment. All right, let me share my screen here. Um, I want to get Body's opinion on a couple of these tweets I saw because I, I don't really know like how to decipher them. Uh, Body can definitely tell me what's going on. So first one uh, is breaking. The Fed just did $120 million USD in emergency repo. Someone important just run out of options to find cash. Air reader, you're in the banking crisis at your peril. Eh, $120 million. Probably nothing. <laughs> no, seriously, like, uh, <laughs> I mean, they. I, I thought the discount. No, in fact, I'm sure the discount window is over now. So, like, where they offered a discounted rate for banks that had too many long-term, low-yielding bonds, um, that they could like trade them in for some kind of liquidity. That's over. Um, is that into March 12th? So yeah, like 120 million, like. That maybe that, that's probably some small regional bank or something. And honestly, I, I wouldn't say that this is the thing, you know. But if we started seeing more, right? If you see more of these stories, this bank and then that bank and another bank keep keep doing this, right? Where you start seeing tens of billions, a hundred billion, then you start to, to start to wonder. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that does make sense. And I this is this is related. Um, this is the Federal Reserve's discount window loan surge to eight point five billion, up from five billion, raising concerns about banking stability, increased borrowing, so just deeper sector challenges. Um, yeah, similar. Yeah, let me add it, that. Let me make that and look into it more. One thing that I would point out, though, is it just shows what a lot of people who are more aware of these things. Like they, they, oh, there's a hard stop date, and it's just the one time. It just reminds me of uh, when the when Bernanke was like, "Yeah, we're, this is just a one-time thing where we're gonna expand the monetary supply temporarily, QE, quantitative easing. It's not monetizing the debt. It's just this one-time thing. And it was a two-time, then a three-time, and they're always bigger. And that Fed window was supposed to close and like it's officially closed, but it's not officially closed because it's unofficially open. And like, and it's just, there's just so full of it, man. Like it's, I mean, but it's not even like, it's not even as much as we expected that they were going to, because the thing is, is they'll come up with some other new ridiculous scheme in order to keep them afloat over here and over there and find a way to just like consolidate the banks even further. And it just goes to show you, though, that that Fed window that's closed is not closed. And it's like kind of open, but unofficially it's open, but not open. And they they can never get their story straight because it's always like, oh, we're already on to the next lie. You guys still listening to that one? I... Well, rem they, remember, um, there's nothing more permanent than the temporary government program. I do think that the Fed discount window was um, I want to say it was started in response to 2008. Um, maybe it wasn't 2008. It's been around for a long time, but what they did is like expanded the liquidity of that window. Like you could certain assets or whatever you could bring to them, um, or that you normally couldn't bring to them for one year. They said, okay, you can bring assets of, I don't know. They like widened the criteria so that banks could, could bring their assets and get liquidity or something like that. Um, it's been a year, so I've, you know, kind of fuzzy on the details, but the Fed discount window has been around for a while, but I am pretty sure it did start as one of those like emergency measure programs when there was some problem. Yeah. And I'm sure they're going to repeg gold to the dollar any minute now. <laughs> any day. All right. Not, um... not, not everybody who was alive when that happened is dead yet. So they just got to wait a little longer and then they're finally going to close that temporary little issue that they had. Hey, you know, um, while I uh, denounce our opponents here, our enemies, uh, I respect the hustle. Like these guys, there's too many Austrians out there that aren't acknowledging that somehow they got the rates from zero to 5% after a decade of being at zero without collapsing the global economy. That's important because it means that you can't just sit around and wait for this system to collapse. The, the Austrian, you know, the gold bugs or whoever you like the Austrian school says, Oh, it's going to collapse and everything will, you know, fix itself. The market will, will correct itself. Well, it hasn't corrected itself, which means that you can't just wait around with your gold reserves and your Monero reserves 
hoping that one day it collapses and then you'll be able to to ride into the sunset to, to victory uh, without actually having to do anything, without actually having to fight for anything, without actually having to take some personal risk. Um, on so the, just know that they're going to okay. keep this system running and it'll keep running until we all say no. On the other hand, it's only gotten as high as 5%. And it seems like if they raise it much more, they will start to really break things because they they the inflation is still over 3%, 3.5%, and is actually climbing instead of falling like they want it to. And in the 19, what was it, 80s, they raised the, they had to do the same thing with the stagflation, 70s or 80s, and they had to raise the rates to 20%. So if they had to raise it to 20% then, and they can only get it to 5 or 6% now, what's the next time going to be? They, they might only get it to 1% before it, it starts to break things. So eventually, yeah, I think something's going to break. That was 76 to 84. And the thing is, or I guess you could say 82. And not to date myself too bad, although you can probably see the gray hair when I have the camera on. But the thing is, is I I, I am privy to having read like uh, the old school Austrian literature where people were saying educated highly intelligent people that we build a lot of these philosophies on in 1982 saying that the demise of the dollar was imminent it has you know two to three years at best there's no way it can continue to function and you know uh, uh, some people have asked me on a different show like what what uh what my moment of awakening was well it was ruby ridge and i remember back in the day during um uh during what was it the uh waco incident um a lot of us thought that's it it's civil war it's going to be red states versus blue states was the thing that they i mean they still say it now but um it, you know people thought the, the the rise is imminent the civil war is here we're all doomed you know world war three and it's been two decades and the, the thing is is money isn't backed by nothing they tell you flat out what it's backed by it's backed by the full faith and credit and and then credit is also belief so like it's root it's etymol etymological origins is belief so faith and belief it's a religion people they tell you that it's a religion and people are status through and through they they love their government they love their their neurotic oh just please leave me alone as long as i keep having dollars then they'll leave me alone and everybody else can fall and die into the rat race of despotic tyranny but they'll leave me alone because i play ball and i play i pay my taxes and i back the blue and i love licking government boots but i, I mean i digress my point is is They've been saying the dollar was going to collapse since the early 80s. They've been saying that like, the end is nigh forever, and Body is absolutely right. Like, these people can come up with scams that boggle the mind, because when you're a sociopath with absolutely no moral principles whatsoever, you will lie about the sun coming up tomorrow. You will lie about needing to drink water to survive, because you don't care who gets destroyed in order to prop up the Ponzi scheme a little bit longer and drink your children's blood and, you know, shed your lizard skin and all of that stuff. They'll go on forever, people. It looks like the dollar will only collapse after every other sovereign currency have collapsed because the other currency, except the Middle Eastern ones, they are all like in dire situation so i think those currencies will collapse first like argentina's peso it was gone so the other currencies will go then i think at last dollar will die that's that's uh commonly referred to as the milkshake theory the dollar milkshake theory and if anybody wants to look into it it's good it's good to understand for sure and there's probably a lot of truth to that um, but I think what body is saying even more than that is the fact, you know, the fact that they got interest rates up to where they did and the, the games that they played to pull it off without everything going completely a wall. Well, another side to that, too, is look at how much shares of every major stock is owned by a handful of people. Look at, 
you know, they, they build these schemes off of the back of market productivity and they know exactly how far they can tow the line algorithmically before it's a total collapse, before people will revolt. You know, social media has a lot to do with that too. They can get a, a, a good idea of where people are at and what their breaking points are and just tow that line. Yeah, yeah, I think so actually um, the, whole medical, yeah, I think the whole medical yeah, the whole medical tyranny was very instructive in that regard. It felt like I had a personal line in the sand where I said, "I'm going to get violent if they make me take a vaccine," um, because at that point, you know, they they my life is over. If they make me or my family take that that crap, like there's just no way. Like I, I was that was my line in the sand, and it turns out I think that was the line in the sand for a lot of other people. Um, we started seeing a lot of protests. We saw the Canadian trucker protest. And so these sociopaths, these psychopaths, they pushed right up to that line. And I think they knew. I think they had always planned to push as far as they could possibly go until that point was hit. And I think with social media and, and just basically they've got their finger on the pulse of, of the people in aggregate, um, I think they pushed right up into that line and said, OK, we're here we're going to stop because we know that now like our power could actually come into question if we have some kind of like mass violent event here. Um, and in a similar sense, uh, like you're saying, Alaska, that I think they know exactly how far they can push in the financial markets. I think they know how far people can, you know, how bad of a bear market, how bad of a crash uh, are people willing to sustain? How much inflation um, can they get away with? And, um, you know, I think that it, there, there might be something to be said for maybe they do have to, like, like we were talking about 1970s, 1980s inflation, um, I feel like to get rates up to 5%, they paid for it with inflation um, to avoid collapsing the economy. And it wouldn't surprise me if they they learned this and sort of like map this out in the 70s and the 80s. So I think they're really more on top of it than they were then. But hey, maybe it is possible that we end up in another situation where they've got to, can, they've got to inflate away some of that debt um, and in order to get the rates up a little bit higher. My guess is they they probably won't do that. They'll probably just kind of ride this line for a long time, like keeping rates in the say one to five percent range. But bro, they can like they can do that for they can do it for a decade. They could continue that easily for a decade or maybe even two decades, right? And if they can do it for one or two decades, then they can just practically keep oscillating that forever. So again, that's kind of why I tell people just don't don't make your plans on the dollar collapsing. Like don't make your your get rich. Uh, plans or your freedom plans or how do we take back you know our lives in the country or the world or whatever don't don't plan on the dollar collapsing plan on it not collapsing um, take like five percent of your effort to do the emergency preparedness to have that that readiness in case it does because it might um, but otherwise plan for it to basically continue on and figure out how you're going to navigate that system and help other people get off of that system yeah, yeah I guy, just want to chime in one more thing about that, too. You know, one of the things that prevents the tyranny from happening in the first place, if anybody's interested in history, you can look into documents like Rex 84, uh, which has been updated. And uh, I participated in the update of that, but that's not available for public consumption. But the main thing is, is how these people plan to push that limit is based on what you can't live without. So a really good example is um, if you at least have a graphene phone and know how to use it, if you at least have communication tra channels outside of WLAN, which is like your traditional cell phone networks and stuff, if you know how to communicate with your neighbors outside of the system, if you know how to trade outside of the system, then it prevents them from using that as leverage to control the population. So the thing is, is knowing that there is algorithmic control over the population when people say, oh, they already have my data. What does it matter? Well, I don't think you understand that 99% knowledge gives them almost absolute algorithmic control. But 98% knowledge means there's going to be huge flaws in the projections. And, you know, for every one out of 20 people that doesn't have a complete data set on their day to day activities, that represents a massive, massive hole, because that's also anybody who does business with you or communicates with you or so. That's also a gap in the knowledge on that person. Right. So, if, for example, if everybody who goes to church, right, if you make a habit of turning off your phone 
and putting it in, you know, an an EMF shielding device. And you go to that church and everybody at that church, they go dark while they go to church. You know, that that one gap in in the knowledge base of all of the algorithmic tracking of humanity. Well, now the data set for whatever learning algorithms that are be deployed and so on, now that there's a gap in that data set, that represents a huge flaw in future projections on what you're doing. So everything that you do to improve your privacy just a little bit, every exchange that you make outside of the dollar just a little bit represents a huge barrier in the progress of tyranny. And just to think of how much worse it would be if there weren't people using, you know, Tor or if there weren't people who have Monero and know how to use it, if there weren't people that are growing their own garden, right? That's, that's how much further tyranny would already be. And when people talk, you know, speak ill about the United States, it kind of breaks my heart because even though I hate what's going on in this country, the fact that there's one country where tyranny cannot progress beyond such and such line also holds back tyranny in an innumerable amount of other places. Because like when people use Monero to liberate an Iranian into another country or help a Cuban refugee like do business back home and all of that stuff, that's a huge bulwark against tyranny worldwide that it's one of the reasons why we can't let America fall. We just can't let it fall unless we yeah. have something better. That's why you guys need to win. Amazing, more than Amazing rant. Yeah, and the guy in the chat, he said correctly, as long as you guys have, I think, the naval fleet for trading, and I think Canada and Australia, they have those uranium mines and petrodollar. As long as you guys have those, uh, then I think with two navies ocean act or like uh, upgraded version of like four navies ocean act i think you guys can handle it fine i think the dollar will die at last at the end of i think when every country's currency have collapsed i think that time only dollar will collapse all right um i'm gonna show one more thing um So I noticed this a couple days ago. Um, I don't know if anyone else did, but the blockchain, the Monero, the, or the Monero transaction pool, was full, but in a completely different way. It was full in the opposite way. Instead of thousands of tiny transactions, it was hundreds of extremely large ones. Most of them were about 100 kilobytes and had 149 inputs, and it would take just six transactions to fill up a whole block. So you can see this one block right here had a measly six transactions, and there were about 10 blocks lined up that had just six transactions. And I guess on top of that, the automatic fee was not keeping up properly. And I had a transaction I said at 6 p.m., and it did not get a single confirmation until three hours later even though my my fee rate was higher than these large transactions, my fee rate was like 120, 130 nanoneros per byte. And all of these large ones you can see were only 80. So it looks like these larger transactions were being preferred just because they had a much higher fee, even though the fee rate was technically lower per byte. Uh, so that was that definitely caused some, some issues. Not as much on the node side, more of in people... Uh, trying to actually make transactions and get them confirmed in a reasonable time. You had to really use fast fee unless automatic just happened to be a high enough fee for you. Yeah, these blocks are fat, very fat blocks. Um, and there's a lot of speculation of what that was, but a lot of people, and I thought this, that it is probably the spammers like reconsolidating all of their inputs from spending, you know, spamming like crazy over the past few weeks. Mm -hmm. um some people suggested some other things but yeah what, that was, what are some of the other suggestions like just a different style of attack potentially yeah i was thinking that oh they, they were just doing the opposite thing to see what would happen um but i think it does make sense that they were consolidating i would also you know, point out that it, it could have something to do with testing if i had a lot of data and a lot of 
Monero, I might do something like this to test the, the fee model. No, I mean, that's like, that's the thing is that honestly, like out of all this, this spam attack that's been happening, it's kind of forced some good things to come out of it. Uh, and in reality, I think we talked about this on Saturday. In reality, if it was an adversary, they could be doing this. They could still be doing this or they would have done it smarter. There's a lot of better things they could have done. Um, so it, it could still be an ad adversary, but maybe it's just somebody like playing around, honestly. So, the, yep. The, what, like I, the same what I find interesting... Spamming the, the general fund. <laughs> what I find yeah, really... <laughs> what, I find, what I find really interesting here is that we're talking about, you know, confirmation times of three hours being extremely slow. And we're, like, compared to ACH where it takes three days and you see a whole big difference. I mean, that's still bad, though. I'm not going to pretend like that's remotely good at all. That's still, Oh, yeah, and, no, like, it's, the it's issue definitely not It wasn't good. even with, like, the protocol or anything. Um, it was more of like, I think there's some optimizations to be made with automatic fee because if automatic fee was just a little bit higher, um, it would have been better because I saw some, I saw a lot of transactions that had just a little bit higher fee rate than mine that were getting in way sooner. Uh, and also the, the weight, uh, the preferred fee weight um, could maybe be optimized because there's large transactions, even though very high fee, um, we're talking um, like close to well, let me see this one uh so this this one large transaction it was about 100 kilobytes it had 0 0.008 xmr total fee which is really high um i mean you know relatively but even though the actual fee rate was low it was at 80 nanos per byte so maybe there's some change that can be made there to prefer transactions that have a higher fee rate not just because it's a large transaction um but that was just that was interesting. That was interesting to see. There almost certainly has to be some forum somewhere where a, a group of botnet like Monero millionaires or whatever are like doing some kind of something for the lols is like what I'm starting to lean to. So you should uh, look at those links. Those Zcash guys are also not talking about using random X. And they're also we are now they are discussing what's the advantages of having botnets. Okay, I'm probably gonna bring up this uh, this giveaway first. Um, probably gonna go ahead and run that. So guys, if you haven't commented your receiving address page for Cake Wallet, I'll go and share my screen again. Here, I gotta pull this up. What if we don't have Twitter? Unfortunately, this giveaway is on Twitter. Um, yeah, I no guess Twitter. we have to consider something for not And Twitter. keep in mind, it's, it's, it's to draw attention Twitter. for the normies, people. Like, we need the normies to know about Monero. So it kind of has to be on the public-facing world. Minority. Unfortunately, it is just true that everyone is on Twitter. Um, but if you have other suggestions for how to do giveaways... Uh, not on Twitter, then please let us know. Uh, I'm sure there's other ways, but this was was this is what was chosen. wasn't my choice. So, yep. So yeah, go ahead. Comment down below. I I will give it um, just a few seconds. Well, once I get this, I'm gonna get this Twitter picker site set up, and then I'll run the the giveaway. And there'll be ten people now, receiving twenty five dollars of XMR. Sorry, go ahead. Now about that Ant Miner X five. Somebody somebody earlier mentioned something about buying it in Monero, and that seems like a really dumb idea to me to buy it in Monero when the whole point is to make Monero. If I was going to buy it, I would buy it with crappy dollars and then use it to make good Monero. Well, it just depends on your goals, bro. I mean, one of the reasons why I'm actually super optimistic about a dedicated mining device is distributing significant hash power amongst people invested in the community that doesn't give them any particular competitive advantage. They're just putting more on stake, right? So the, the thing is, is if it was a quality product, I, I mean, I'm kind of the sort of person who would totally buy it. 
like, you know, body was mentioning how the hash rate is down. Well, yeah, I mean, you would not believe how many processors are not mining right now in Alaska because it's starting to get warm. I mean, I don't like my house above, you know, 65 degrees. So it's like, it's, it, it makes a lot of sense that, you know, using it for heat and all of that. But if it wasn't computers that I was using anyway, then I might just run one in a garage or something like that. I mean, why not? You know, it's if you have the fiat to just throw at the hash power of Monero. But the other thing is, if you have Monero and you want to strengthen the network of Monero, I mean, it just really depends a lot. Like, obviously, the liquidity of Monero in Alaska is as such where it would be a huge financial issue up here. But, you know, if Monero was the same fiat price worldwide, then it kind of does make sense. Okay, yeah, fair enough. I might end up I might end up trying to get the money together and buy one just for the lulls, um, for the heat in the winter, especially if I can ramp it up and down, because that thing uses a lot of power. But if I can like ramp it down to like half or something, that would be just about perfect, I think. Well, I mean, I'm seriously thinking about it for my greenhouse. I it would like that would be amazing for you know if you're oh, an you Alaskan go. running a greenhouse year round. Um, I mean, cause I got to heat it somehow. Right. So it's like, if I, if, I mean, that would probably be enough heat, especially on certain plants like citrus plants in Alaska need a lot of heat. You could run it through the root systems, like just blow the air through the root systems or something like that. You could use it to heat your water supply. Like it's, I'm very interested in a dedicated mining machine and it's not about how efficient it is because of where I live. Uh, All uh, right, guys. Abdullah has been talking about that as a potential next uh, Noto product. Yeah, that's why I want him to be at Monerotopia because I would love to vet them personally. But if Abdullah puts one together, I mean, count me in. Shut up and take my money. Go ahead, Tux. All right, you guys. You guys want you want me to do it? Or you <laughs> do it, bro. Do it. All right, all right. Here we go. I'll make sure this. Pull is the dead. trigger. Ten winners. You gotta be following Cake Wallet or Monero.com. Oh, I guess I can't do or. Um, I'm just gonna do at Cake Wallet then. Um, Must follow. Okay. At least fifty. To, this is there are there are a few rules to try and avoid like bot accounts there's a lot of comments on this tweet 188 now um mm -hmm. at least 50 tweets which i think includes like comments and retweets um oh, okay, at least one month old okay all right sweet continue all right so here are the wait so 78 entries loaded oh okay it's just this wasn't the winners yet. It's showing, just showing me everyone. All right. Yeah, I got a lot of people. Oh, shit. All right. Um, Vic. Vic won. I don't know why these are included also. I mean, yeah. just on a matter of principle, I would be kind of like depressed if Vic wasn't on the list. <laughs> you know, it's like, wait a minute. Like, what's going on here? I'm not sure why these accounts, and maybe it's because they were tagged. Let me go back. Oh, retweet picker. Oh, this isn't comment uh, okay. picker. Uh, we're not. We're not doing retweets. We're doing comments.